Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for following the work of the Center for International Relations in Sustainable Development, the Southeast European number one foreign affairs think tank. Uh, we are continuing with uh, our new series of online conversations, the Corona Dialogues. We're reaching out to interesting and knowledgeable people around the world, trying to pick their wisdom uh, about what on earth is going on, what is this crisis about, how to try and approach it, how to resolve it, and what can we expect uh, from the future given the circumstances. Tonight's uh, interlocutor of mine is very different from previous guests of CIRSD, although he does occasionally teach, he occasionally is a professor, but that's not his primary profession. Uh, Martin Varshavsky is a serial entrepreneur, a very successful investor who over the past 30 years created 10 companies that ended up being worth billions of dollars. These companies uh, were in sectors as wide as high tech, real estate, here, biotech, but uh, today they are collectively worth uh, several billion dollars and they were all started by our interlocutor from this evening. Uh, he was born in Argentina, uh, where he grew up during the infamous Dirty War, where uh, his family members were purged. Uh, some of his family members got killed. Uh, and he himself almost died of a bomb that exploded just next to his house. Uh, as a home family, uh, and at the age of 22, uh, following the death of his father, uh, he remained the only one in the family making income. Uh, so he started a business to sustain his family and to pay his way through college. And he made his first million dollars at the age of 27. From there, he went on to create a series of companies, and I'm not going to mention all of them. I'm going to mention Viatel, uh, the first pan-European fiber optic network, Gestel Telecom, uh, first telecom provider to compete with uh, traditional big incumbents in the Spanish market and beyond. He created an internet company, ya.com, that uh, was sold to Deutsche Telekom for $650 million. Olia, uh, now one of the largest renewable energy companies, he created FON uh, after consultation and work with uh, some of the top gurus of world tech, including Sergey Brim, the founder of Google. Uh, a few years ago, uh, at a time when he and I met and became friends, he set up a state-of-art fertility clinic in Cal. Uh, that fertility clinic grew in the last few years into the largest chain of fertility clinics in the United States of America. Uh, he moved uh, on to the biotech. He is the chairman and owner of Overture Life, which is focused on automating the embryology lab. He is also a uh, founder and a chief of GoGo -Go Networks in Spain and beyond. Uh, he teaches occasionally at Columbia University Business School in New York, as well as at the IE Business School in Madrid. Uh, he is nowadays uh, in the midst of the corona crisis, co-heading the task force of private sector leaders in Spain who are assisting the government in Madrid deal with the consequences of the catastrophe caused by the coronavirus. Uh, but first and foremost, Martin Versovsky is a dear and close friend. It is a great honor to have him tonight with us uh, as a guest in our Corona Dialogues. Uh, good evening. How are you? 
how is the family and how are the things in Spain? Well, it's been a month that I've been at this farm in the island of Menorca in Spain. The reason why I've been here for a longer time than you would have guessed is because I had been following what had happened in China and was concerned for my family and myself. And we decided to seclude ourselves in the farm before the lockdown. So we plan for a long stay here. Uh, so personally, we're doing pretty well, um, but all of Spain is on lockdown and uh, especially children in Spain haven't been able to go out under any circumstance for the last close to four weeks. So it's been pretty difficult, I would say, for the people of Spain, the people of Europe, and now the people of the USA. So, but um, what is the, the latest from Spain? Uh, a few days ago, there was a, uh, a little bit of an encouraging trend with a number of deaths going. It seems that uh, it's going back to, uh, to rising again. Well, I don't think so. I think, yes, it's true that yesterday and today the de daily deaths went up, but I feel the trend I mean, I wrote an article in a paper here in Spain in which I said that last week was going to be the worst and that this week was going to be better and next week significantly better because isolation works. And I think we will see that the total number of deaths for this week will be much lower than last week and mm -hmm. the week after will be low. The, it is true that the last two days haven't been uh, as good as we would hope, but I have I built a model around a month ago on the evolution of this pandemic uh, for Spain. Um, I'm predicting 674 deaths for tomorrow. We'll see what comes out, but the model has been pretty good at predicting what's going to happen, and it predicts a decline from now until the end of May. I think isolation will work. The question is, of course, when Here's you stop isolation. Yeah, but the, your, your isolation definitely is uh, having a positive impact. But if you are isolating everybody, and this is, by the way, what is happening in a number of countries, including my country uh, at certain times, um, the economy obviously comes to a halt. And there is much destruction that, and there are going to be long-term repercussions for the welfare of the people. Uh, including also saving lives of the people. So uh, you recently wrote a paper uh, a few days ago, if I'm not mistaken. You wrote a paper in which you try to think of a policy, how to get out of a lockdown, how to make sure that uh, you uh, minimize death, you minimize the impact on health of the people, but also try to minimize at the same time impact on the economy short term and long term and together with it, the welfare of the people can you tell us about your policy idea well my main businesses are in the united states right so even though i live here i run the largest chain of fertility clinics in the us i'm the chairman and founder of that company um and i'm particularly concerned about what's happening in the usa where i used to live um because the, the United States doesn't have a clear federal policy on what to do with COVID. And the pandemic has been evolving differently on different states. Um, I think that the lockdown is necessary, certainly in some parts of the United States, like New York, that's been affected the most. I think the the big cities that will be affected the most by this pandemic will be Milan, Madrid, Paris, London, and New York. Um, and so right now, it's very difficult to suggest that things should change in the United States and in Europe. But I think very soon, we, we will see that uh, isolation works. And the only reason to do lockdowns is to flatten the curve and allow the health services to treat people uh, with time um, when you see saturated health services, like the ones of Madrid, 
even compared to Barcelona, you see much better outcomes in Barcelona than Madrid because Madrid has a saturated health service. But this saturation um, doesn't mean that we, uh, when, we're, when we're out of lockdown because there isn't any saturation, we still have to live with the virus, right? It's sort of like lockdowns are kind of like the chemotherapy of, of treating with, with pandemics. They, they kill the virus, but they kill society too, right? And, and so now we have to think, how do we get society back on its feet? How do we get the economy back on its feet? And I, what I propose in my paper is that it's something that actually would probably normally be illegal under any circumstance, which is to split the working population by age. But it seems that as horrible as this sounds, when you look at the number of dead in countries like Spain and Italy, the number of dead under 40, it is an incredibly low amount of people. I mean, each death is sad, but we're talking about in a country of Spain with maybe 14,000 dead, you're talking about maybe 30 people under 40 who have died. Maybe at most 40, 45, depends on how you count the figures that are coming out, but then the numbers are lower than a regular flu for people under 40. So what I recommend is that we divide the population in those under 40, 40 to 65 and 65 and over, because 65 and over are 90 uh, percent, 91 percent of the dead. And so we have to approach, we have to take an ageist approach, which is which is normally not what we want to do as a society, but if we want to protect people and save the economy, the young are certainly in better a better uh, situation to fight this virus as opposed to the regular flu or as opposed to historical viruses like polio. These are viruses. This virus is is focused on the old. So what you're trying to suggest is that there should be a line drawn on the age. Uh, I believe you you're talking about uh, 45, and then you say like, okay, everybody who is under the age of 45 should be allowed to go out and they should be somehow separated and split uh, physically from those aged 45 plus and then after a while you start letting out if you will older and older categories and by the time you get to the i don't know 65 plus which are the most vulnerable uh, uh people uh by then you would have hoped to have a vaccine. So you have like a timed release uh, of uh, the population into the society, right? Did I understand this well? It, yes, but uh, except that I, it's not that I would hope to have a vaccine. I, I, yes, I would love to, I would hope, hope maybe the right word, but it's not that I expect a vaccine uh, soon. It's that when most of society is immunized, it is unlikely or less likely that those over 65 will die. And if we've seen so much death in Spain and Italy, this is because surprisingly Spain and Italy are the two longest living countries in the world together with Japan. And in, in Spain and Italy, there's tremendous contact with the elderly. People visit them frequently, hug them frequently, kiss them frequently. And unfortunately with this pandemic, they kill them frequently without knowing. And so, um, it is the intergenerational contact that has made Spain and Italy so vulnerable. And, and we're going to have to learn to live without that for maybe six months or so until almost everyone who comes into contact, elderly or old, have, have been immunized. If not, it is what are, immunized. And what are you doing uh, right now uh, with the group of this group of um, people who are co making up this task force? How are you assisting the government in Madrid to deal with the situation? What is this about? Well, when the pandemic started, the president of Madrid, Isabel Ayuso, uh, called me up or actually WhatsApp me <laughs> and asked me if I could uh, get together or lead a task force to fight the pandemic by digital means. And uh, I put together a group uh, that included uh, Telefonica, Ferrovial, 
uh, Carto de Bev, Mendes Altaren, uh, Force Manager, six companies we got together. And in a hackathon, we were able to build the apps that now the government is using all over Spain to um, diagnose and handle the incoming flow of uh, coronavirus, COVID nations because the phone lines were just unable, there weren't enough people to answer the phones. The calls. Yes, so that's been and going on very well. App, are, you, are you using this app also in, um, in the effort to, uh, to also uh, do the geolocationing of uh, those who are infected or are, are suspected or not? We are not doing that. I am in favor of doing that. I'm very much in favor of doing that. It was illegal, but now the government has just made it legal to do that, um, which I think it's a great idea because, of course, under normal circumstances, we want our privacy, but I think we want our life more than our privacy in these circumstances. And so, I thought, so warning those around you that you are infected or when you find out that you're infected to trace those who had contact with you is a pretty good idea and it's being done in in China but it's also been done in Korea or it's also been done I mean it's been done in authoritarian Asia but it's been done in democratic Asia Germany just said they're going to do the same thing and and I think Spain has to do the same thing this is a troubling time for democracy but I, but I think are it, you not afraid, for, are you for not afraid that uh, one of the outcomes, one of the consequences of this, would be that uh, those kind of uh, uh, increased grip on people's privacy on behalf of the government, be it authoritarian or not so authoritarian at this moment, uh, is actually not going to be released or removed uh, in the future because we never know. Uh, how long is this going to last? We don't know if there's going to be a return of this particular pandemic or perhaps tomorrow another pandemic or another threat to, uh, to the public safety. Don't you think that there is a danger that once you start introducing these measures, uh, the governments are going to be naturally inclined to uh, hold on to this uh, additional uh, if you were leverage on uh, on citizens. Well, I'll give you an argument in your favor and one in my favor. Um, in your favor, I would say that after 9-11, we introduced uh, controls at airports that have never been eliminated. We had a life pre-9-11 and a life post-9-11. And travel post-9-11 has never improved that that is that uh airports around the world uh search you in a way that would have been unthinkable before 9 11 right so that would be an argument in your favor that after these um after those freedoms were taken away from us of just boarding a plane uh going through an arch but not taking off our shoes and doing everything we do now that 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 we never return to that. Now, in this case, I think we have um, to see if new viruses or this virus uh, lingers on. Uh, I mean, terrorism lingered on, right? It's not that terrorism, not that there was 9-11 and terrorism then went away, right? We continue to have terrorism. And so the question is, are we going to continue go having these virus viruses in which if we, I would agree with you, but I think I know, and you know personally, a lot of people in power, and they tend to come into flavors, uh, democratic or authoritarian. For the democratic, they will not want that power. My friends who are democratic, I don't think they want that power. By the way, my friends who run Google and Facebook, 
I don't think they spend their time looking at the private lives of the people who use Google and Facebook. And Google and Facebook also knows a lot about you. But I think they're mostly trying to sell you ads, right? Um, and that's, that's their intention. I think people who run democratic countries and who are true Democrats are mostly trying to do what, whatever they believe the population wants to make the country a better place. I don't think they'll take a special pleasure in, in, in spying on people. But I think those who have authoritarian yeah. instincts will. So definitely those who do have authoritarian instincts are not going to release these new apps easily. They're not going to let them go all that easily because this is going to just assist them in uh, extending or strengthening their authoritarian rule. Uh, but um, let us move to, uh, to the field of um, economy. The global economy is in doldrums and uh, we have seen in the uh, last uh, few days and weeks uh, some very strong measures taken by the governments of the developed world, leading with the United States. Two trillion dollars stimulus and uh, many European countries at the national level. We yet have to see what's going to happen at the pan-EU level, if anything. Uh, but uh, we're de facto talking about uh, bazooka hitting uh, of this problem. Uh, huge amounts of money are being thrown at uh, the market. Now, uh, we see that there is now a dichotomy. Uh, the real economy continues to go down because things are not produced and uh, companies that are uh, making things, if you will, uh, they're continuing to struggle. Whereas the markets, uh, they are starting to recover. So uh, do you think that this was just to calm the markets or uh, was it to do with a real fixing of the economy? Or is it gonna be needed perhaps down the road uh, additional uh, financing additional amounts of money, additional bazookas, uh, I don't know, six or 12 months down the road. And I'm just talking about the developed world right now. Well, I think the, the world, we're lucky that this happened in an environment of negative interest rates or zero or negative interest rates. If this had happened in another environment, we would have a real problem. But right now, you can borrow money without paying the consequences, and the consequences is interest, right? And so, right now, it is possible to increase the debt um, without destroying the economy, because, because for some reason, I mean, certainly not me, but some people are willing to part with their money for no interest right um well i should say some of my companies have deposits in german banks that take money away from you while you have the money with deutsche bank right so i should say i correct that myself included and so the question here is how long is this going to last and people don't work people stay at home you're saying stay at home stay at home don't work but somehow society is paying for their food, is paying for their mortgage, is paying for their rent, is paying for their electrical bill, their telecoms bill. How long can this go on? In an environment of zero interest rates, you could say, well, I just continue to borrow and pay people to, to, to stay at home. But if we do this long enough, interest rates are not going to be negative or zero anymore. The people who lend the money are going to begin to feel, well, maybe I'm never going to give pay back because nobody's working to pay me back, right? Mm -hmm. And so in, and I think that this opportunity of governments will lend. They will not have uh, the possibility of continuing to pay people for doing nothing. And also there's no need to pay them to do nothing because as we already said, at least those under 40, have very, very little to fear from, the, from, from COVID. Uh, some of them do need medical care, 
But if you live in a country without saturated medical care and you're under 40, your chances of dying of these are, are almost zero. And so, and so we could at least have a significant portion of the workforce back. Um, and we have to think that there are countries like Sweden who have done uh, a policy that a lot of people think is suicidal. And I thought it was suicidal, but so far they're, they're getting away with it, which is they kept schools open, uh, lower schools, primary schools, not high schools, senior high schools and universities, because they saw that children um, never die of this. And it, this is corroborated by Italy, corroborated by Spain. And so if children never die of this, and those under 40, 45 never die of this, or very rarely die of this, as I said, in Spain, less than 40 people out of 13,000, then there is a whole group of society that can go on pretty much normally. The group that you have to watch out for is the 40 to 65, and the group that you definitely have to watch out for is 65 and over. Plus. And so, mm -hmm. and so I, I think that the governments will soon realize this. In fact, an hour ago, Italy announced that they're reopening companies after Easter, and Spain is about to announce something similar. Um, Denmark and Norway yesterday said that they were going to op open primary schools like Sweden. So instead of going Sweden the way of Denmark, Denmark is going the way of Sweden. The way of Sweden. And I think soon people... Let me ask you, but let when... me ask you one, one thing. Uh, one thing that I noticed is that uh, the United States countries, they opt for this bazooka help uh tens of th well actually hundreds of billions and thousands of billions of dollars being thrown at the economy but uh china has not done that so why do you think that the chinese have not gone this way of the western economies are they saving their stimulus for uh, a growth period for further down the road uh, for the time when for example, in the West, it's not going to be possible to keep throwing money and then throwing money that would be an option for China uh, would actually give better results. Why do you think that there is this uh, difference between China and the West in dealing with the crisis? Because I think the Chinese were pretty good at uh, drastically containing this in Wuhan they had very few deaths all over China. I think Asians in general are almost wired differently to protect themselves from pandemic. They, pandemics, they, they wear masks, they're very compliant. Whether you're a Korean, a Japanese, or you're Chinese, or a Singaporean, or a Taiwanese, everybody's behaving the same way. Everybody's using the same apps. Everybody's going through massive testing. Everybody's taking their temperature 37, uh, under 37 to go to work. Everybody, people are very compliant. And so I think in places, the economic loss that they are facing is much lower than the economic loss that we are facing in Europe and that the United States is facing. And that's probably because of the nature of, of, of the Asian people as opposed to the Western people um, on how compliant they are. So I, don't, I think I they see, just and, uh, don't need these packages. Th these packages. So, but now uh, looking at various industries, uh, which industries do you think uh, are going to be able to recover first from this and which industries you think are going to be the laggards uh, in the time to come? Well, I have spent a lot of my life building digital companies. And if you spent a lot of time building digital companies, now is your prime time. Like anything digital, digital is thriving right now because that's all people can do. That's what you're, you and I are doing right now, having a digital meeting and with the audience and with you and I. And, and so in my own portfolio, now we're talking about, I, we about my in, in healthcare, and now we're talking 
me as an investor in in my own portfolio i saw the 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 downtrend of the market for digital companies as a buying opportunity i don't really see how a company like amazon um, microsoft uh, will be hurt by this. Apple, maybe with the production chains, uh, Google, maybe lowering of the ads. Also, um, Facebook with lowering of ads, but certainly Netflix, people are spending their life on Netflix now. Amazing shows to see. Um, so the digital world is pretty protected. By my, but for example, my healthcare company that provides IVF for people to have babies, is now in in very in, in a great deal of difficulty because we have to pay everybody and no patients can see us. So companies that need the presence of somebody where you need to show up at a restaurant, at a hotel, at a healthcare company that provides these type of services, uh, travel, uh, tourism, those industries are being decimated right now. It, it is a terrible, terrible time for those industries um that's hence the urgency to reopen the economy at least on the segments that are safe to do so but don't you think that uh, things are never going to get back or it's going to take a very very long time for things to go back for you know restaurants hotels are you really gonna keep going to cinemas are you gonna avoid uh, flying when you can uh, there must be some businesses that are uh, irrevocably hurt by this, don't you think? Some businesses will go bankrupt forever, for sure. But let's say if you have a, you're a small restaurant, you cannot afford to go a few months without revenue. So I, I agree with that. But in general, I do not think this pandemic will turn out to be what people right now think it is, okay? Um, I think one of the one of the mistakes that people make with this pandemic comes out of how data is reported about the pandemic. And the data is reported by a funnel, which includes diagnosed, hospitalized, uh, intensive care patients and deaths, right? And so when you look at a funnel like this, for example, the funnel of Spain today, um, it works out to be like 140,000 uh, 150,000 diagnosed and around 14,000 dead. And you look at that and you say, wow, this is like a, the biggest killer of humanity. 10% of people who get this die, right? And you start thinking like you are thinking right now and like many people are thinking. But that is because we have not done random testing and we have not really tried to see if the people without symptoms we, have, we haven't organized an effort except in Iceland that it was done, but a tiny country in terms of population that is, that is like a neighborhood of Madrid. But, but in any case, when they did that, they found out in Iceland what they probably will find out in many other places, which is that a large amount of the population is already immunized against these. In, there's estimates by Imperial College that maybe 20% of Spaniards have been in contact with these. So now, if 9 million Spaniards were exposed and only 13,000 died, that's not 140,000 to 13,000. That's like 9 million to 13,000. And then you start wondering, well, how lethal is this thing? And then when you look at the dead and you see that 95% of the dead are over 60, and the vast majority, by the way, of that group are over 75, and the median age is 79 and a half, the median age. So you realize that this is actually quite selective killer of humanity. It is almost humanity that if going to die in the next two years, you die in the next two weeks, but, which is horrible. But if you were not going to die in the next two years, it is extremely unlikely that you're going to die in the next two weeks, right? So of course, those who are 80, die in large numbers because they were going to die between 80 and 82 but those who are 50 dying very very few die because they were not going to die between 50 and 52. Um, so my overall view of this pandemic is that we are not overreacting because we need the lockdowns to flatten the curve 
but we are too traumatized in relationship to what really is going to happen when this virus goes through the whole population of every country, which is likely going to do because it, it is hard to prevent the virus from going through the population. Um, but we, even yeah. when it does, it's not what we think. Yeah, but the thing is that uh, uh, a lot of things follow actually the just the impression and, and the sentiment. And uh, are you not worried uh, how the world after this is going to function, function in terms of uh, turning inward, uh, breaking up supply chains, uh, everyone for himself, uh, America first, uh, Germany first, China first, and so on and so forth, instead of more global cooperation. This pandemic showed that uh, there is very little global cooperation uh, when it becomes very difficult. Do you think that this is um, going to go away? What do you think are going to be the, uh, the global repercussions of this on, on global cooperation? I agree that this pandemic is a huge blow on global cooperation because it showed the worst of everybody. Like not only even the worst of countries versus countries, but I saw the worst of, of people hating the people of Madrid because they got it first and everybody said people from Madrid don't come here. And now I see in the US people hating people from New York and they say people from New York don't come here. People become kind of the worst. I, I think, I think pan, pandemics bring out kind of the worst in people. Um, there have been some good gestures and there have been good, good things, but I wouldn't say that the world has shown its best during this pandemic, so I agree with you with that. But I also believe that a pandemic is something that there's a storm, and then after the storm, there's some, that there's damage. But I don't think this is a transformational event. Um, I think this is more like a, uh, like something that that we're going to rebuild from, um, and I don't think you know when 9/11 happened, people thought there's going to be another 9/11 and another 9/11 and another 9/11, and frankly, there was never another 9/11. There were there were attacks, but never as spectacular, and they never killed 3,000 people in one shot again, right? Uh, because we got smart about fighting terrorism. And I think we will get smart about fighting pandemics. And I don't think there's another one coming that will get us the way this one got us. I, I think this one got us the way Bin Laden got us or the way some other thing get us when we're not ready, but then we will be ready. Um, and so I think people will, uh, uh, think of the consequences of having not acted together. I think the world is together in a pandemic. I mean, it's together in misery, but it's together. It's called a pandemic. It's the most globalized thing that could happen to us. And so I am not as negative as you are, but I am concerned. Well, uh, if, uh, this is definitely uh, the biggest crisis of the 21st century so far. And uh, if one wants to try and draw lessons from history, well, in the 20th century, um, there were very, very different outcomes, if you will, of, of, uh, of global uh, earthquakes, like, say, two world wars. After the First World War, you had, as a result of it, uh, a rise of totalitarian ideologies and the Great Depression and everything that followed, culminating in the Second World War. Whereas after the Second World War, um, it was a much more sober and uh, I'd say responsible approach leading to the creation of the United Nations, uh, arguably the most peaceful era in human history. Uh, don't you think that after this uh, event, there could be a uh, big prisoner's dilemma, if you will, for the two most powerful people in the world, uh, President Xi Jinping of China and whoever is the president of the United States 
in January of next year, like an ultimate prisoner's dilemma as to whether to work with each other and make a leap of faith or to work against each other like they have been working in the last few years. Do you think that this pandemic is going to make people wake up and realize that the only way to fix the global economy uh, is to work together? The only way to address things like climate change is to work together? Or you think this is, there is a danger of uh, after the pandemic is over, after the truce that is imposed on uh, global competition, geopolitical rivalry and so on, after this truce is over, after this pandemic is over, we can just experience the acceleration of history, the acceleration in the direction that we have seen in the last few years, which is, uh, which is de facto uh, increased competition and uh, something akin to a Cold War, potentially much colder than, than the one of the 20th century. Well, I think that now we're entering a part of the conversation in which you are much more of an expert than I am. I think you have the most relevant experience to answer that question. As an entrepreneur, a person who thinks of new technologies, a person who thinks of how technology shapes the future, as a person who works with such things as genetic testing of embryos or artificial intelligence or driverless cars or things that I'm involved with, I see this as a technology problem. I think here's this virus that acts on the ACE2 receptors that enters our lungs, that gives us uh, a, an autoimmune shock. Uh, I mean, it, I think of it as a technical problem, a technical problem that should have a technical solution, which is a treatment or a vaccine. I also think of the social consequences, but only insofar as uh, behavior that can be illicit, like on the app, like Corona Madrid, the app we built, this behavior is meant to prevent the pandemic because isolation prevents the virus from spreading from person to person. So I believe that behavioral changes are like, well, let's say what condoms was to AIDS, isolation is to COVID, right? It's, it's a way of preventing the physical spread of, of the virus. But in terms of what's going, this is going to do to the world order, that I think Vuk, you're more, more qualified than me to answer. Thank you. Thank you for that. I'll take it as a huge compliment coming from a person like you. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, what would be your advice for someone who lives in the Balkans, is young in his, say, 20s uh, or perhaps early 30s, and uh, wants to look at this situation as a potential opportunity? What would be the advice to someone from uh, a humble part of the world, not so well integrated into the European economy or the world economy, how to make the best out of this situation? Well, many people right now are at home with a computer, right? And that's all you have, you're at home with a computer. If you're at home with a computer, I think the best thing you can do now is either build a digital product or educate yourself through technology. You can either build a product, meaning it could be a game, or when you look at, at things, digital products that are built, they're sometimes built with tiny teams. You don't need a gigantic team to build a, a successful game. You need ingenuity, you need creativity. Building games is the equivalent of what would have been in the past to write a book or to paint. It's something that you need a canvas, a brush, or you need a pen and paper. It's things that a person or a small group of people, when you look at the builders of Minecraft or the builders of, of Angry Birds or the builders of Brawlers, or I mean, they, they, the small companies build these things. And sure, in the Balkans, you can have a team that can do something like that, games, apps. Uh, but there's also amazing 
um, universities online, Coursera, Udacity. It's also a time to educate yourself, to take classes in anything that you may want to do after the isolation is, is over, right? Um, so I, I would recommend either building or learning do, do, using digital means. Thank you very much. This is very this is a very good piece of advice, especially for uh, our uh, young people in Serbia and the rest of the Balkans. I'm now going to go to the last section of my questions to you, but uh, I'm going to make this uh, a little bit tricky. I'm going to ask you to give a yes or a no answer. Uh, so I don't know is not an option. It depends is not an option. You just need to basically make a bet yes or no we're talking about the year 20 so uh, fast forward 10 years from now it's the year 2030 i'm going to give you a series of statements and you answer to me positively or negatively is this going to happen yes or no this is not going to happen so let me start uh year 2030 is china going to be economically at least as powerful as the united states Yes. Is there going to be another EU state that will have followed the path of the UK in leaving the full membership of the European Union? I can't qualify my questions, right? I have to say yes or no. Uh, yes, just yes or is, no. No. Cars will fly. Yes. Okay, New York in 2030 is still going to be the place which has the highest number of billionaires. No. Uh, Bitcoin or something similar another cryptocurrency is bitcoin or another cryptocurrency going to become a reserve currency for the world governments no is there going to be less freedom and democracy in the world than what we have today uh I'll say no. So there's going to be more democracy. We are we are on the same page here. I, we are the optimist. I, I, in this. I am speaking with my heart in this one. Okay. Uh, cancer is going to be a curable disease. Mostly yes. Uh, consumption of renewable resources, consumption of energy from renewable resources is going to become bigger than the consumption of energy from fossil fuels. Yes. There will be no more paper money in developed economies. Yes. Catalonia is going to become an independent state. No. Jeff Bezos is still going to be the richest man in the world. No. There is going to be a South American Union. No. Novak Djokovic is going to be celebrated as the greatest tennis player of all times. Uh, yes. <laughs> oh my God, that, that's the first answer that I got surprised <laughs> with. But coming from you, it's, uh, it's a big boost for optimism. So let me ask my final question that comes from me in this interview. In 10 years from now, in 2030, are you going to be richer than you are today? Yes. Good. That's a very positive way to end the Blitz.
part of these uh, interviews. And uh, now we are going to go to questions that I collected from our social networks, uh, people who are following the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development. They sent some extremely interesting questions to you. And I am going to start uh, with a question from Lazar, who is asking you, uh, in your educated opinion, is a super entrepreneur and a big investor, uh, which are the top three companies in the world with the greatest potential in the world economy in the coming years? Uh, Alphabet, Apple, and uh, Amazon. So all are tech companies and you are obviously a uh, big time long and bullish on those companies. Um, a question coming from Nenad. What is your take on the 5G technology impact and health? Uh, is this just a conspiracy theory or is there a reason for us to be concerned with the rolling out of 5G? It is 100% a conspiracy theory. Okay, so that's fair enough. Um, Surjan is asking a question. Uh, what is this going to mean for migrant crisis? migrations coming to Europe. Is there a danger that we are going to end with a Trump-like wall around Europe now that there is going to be even less enthusiasm to receive migrants than it was before? Well, Europe has a serious traffic problem. We have very few children in Europe. We almost have no children in Europe in terms of replenishing Europe. So um, it's either migrants or robots, and I think it will be migrants for a while. I think as much as people may dislike uh, the idea, I mean, those who are xenophobic and Trump-like, um, certainly I, I'm an immigrant myself and I my heart is with immigrants, but for people who think differently, they will have a hard time because there will not be an alternative as the birth rates are so low in Europe. So a question from Bane. Uh, rich have been investing for decades into private Medicare only to learn that uh, in this crisis, uh, it's not terribly efficient way of saving their health because health system becomes crowded and when masses become um, incapable of uh, going to work because of a pandemic, uh, their wealth uh, starts uh, melting down. Uh, is this crisis going to mean uh, that uh, there'll be a serious overhaul or at least serious rethinking of uh, international healthcare policies, uh, obviously tilting more towards universal healthcare. Well, if the question relates to the United States, I would say for sure, people will think again about the system that the US has. If the question relates to people in Germany, for example, I think they'll be pretty happy with the system they have. They have a over 100,000 diagnosed so far and 2,000 deaths, which is an incredibly low number. They have a, a trained scientist as, as the country leader uh, who is in charge of moving the machinery of private and public services in healthcare extremely well. So I think there will be winners and losers out of the pandemic. And the losers will be the systems that normally exclude people, but in this case, which is all about contagiousness, uh, even the homeless, which are people who many people, many people in America have no heart for them. When you have a pandemic, you realize that everybody uh, is at risk together. So I, I think hopefully this pandemic will have a positive outcome, which is uh, an election of a, of a 
president who will think in those terms, meaning how to provide health care to everybody. Um, there's a question from Angela, uh, and you addressed it a little bit earlier, part of it. She's asking how to ensure that uh, increased monitoring through apps and other devices and programs being now used in the pandemic, they don't end up uh, keeping human rights suspended or violated in a systemic way. You mentioned earlier that you hope that democratic leaders and, uh, and the countries that are democracies or that were democracies before this crisis, that uh, they're gonna have uh, the responsibility to give it up, to release, to return things to normal. But uh, other than hoping for the benevolence of political leaders who are in power, what are the ways to ensure that uh, this thing doesn't end up uh, taking away from us the rights that we've been enjoying so far? Well, the first comment I would make that I didn't make before is why, why would you trust, uh, let's say, Google or Apple more than your own government if you live in a country, let's say, like Spain or like France or Germany? Um, that's a fundamental question. Like, do we trust more an American company uh, in a country led by President Trump than we trust the government of our own countries? Because it, let's be fair, these companies know everything about us and they've known everything about us for a long time. In fact, I'm a fan of the Google reports that show you where you've been in the world because they, they are useful for me as a diary of all the travel I do. And I just got my Google report this morning and it was the first time ever that I had been in one place for one month in my life, right? I hadn't gone anywhere, but Google knows that. Google knows where I am. Google knows uh, what I do. And we kind of make a, a deal with them. We say, look, I'll tell you where I am and you'll tell me if there's traffic, for example. So I avoid traffic, right? Or, or things like that, or ways that belongs to Google, to Alphabet. So, if we are willing to give them so much information about ourselves, why wouldn't we give it to government who, to governments who are trying to save our lives? Because that's that's what the app we built for the government does. I mean, the app we built, yeah, we're companies, but we gave it to the government. We cannot even see what's inside. We gave everything to the government. Like, it's an app we we give the code and gave it to them, right? So. My answer is still the same. If you live in a country with authoritarian instincts, now it's a worse time for you because the government will use this to justify the oppression of the liberties of the people. If you live in a country without authoritarian instincts, I don't think you have much to fear for relinquishing your freedom over a month or two or three. Well, I must admit that you failed to cheer up too many people watching us today <laughs> in the Balkans. Uh, but let's move on to, uh, to another question. Tanya is asking you, what was the biggest mistake of your professional career? Well, the biggest mistake in terms of uh, money I lost, uh, which is like 200 million euros of which 50 million were my own, was in building the first cloud computing company in Europe called Einsteinet ahead of its time. It's the only company I built where I lost my money and that of my investors. And it was the right idea, cloud computing really took off, but two years too early. So uh, Slobodan is asking you, uh, Will we see for the first time in a long, long time de-urbanization as a result of this pandemic and, and together with it, negative impact on real estate in the most uh, urban areas of the world? Uh, that's actually a very good question. It's interesting. I thought about this when I was 
with during this and the fact that we are at a farm and we came to the farm before the lockdown in Spain and how we thought of this farm as a, place, a safe place to be. And will there be many more people who think of the countryside as a safe place to be and the social distancing that is natural in the countryside because of the low density? Will people never see elevators the same way? Will they think, oh, this is an elevator. This is also a place where I could get something. I, I don't think this is going to go on uh, forever because I do think the SARS-CoV-2 is, is sort of the Bin Laden of viruses. It's attacking us now, we're all obsessed, but I think I don't think we're getting SARS-CoV-3 and SARS-CoV-4. I think I think we mm -hmm. probably got these. I think when the when Trump calls this a Chinese virus, saying that is pretty racist, but saying that it's a virus that came from China is not racist. And saying that it's likely a virus that came from China because they have wet markets is not racist. And asking to China that if they want to go on trading with us to please not have wet markets anymore is actually a pretty reasonable thing to ask. And so I think we've seen enough trouble with grabbing live animals and killing them and eating them. We believe that the industry, the food industries we have in the West uh, tend to be safer with problems, but still safer. And if we, if China rises to that level of of, of safety, it is unlikely we're going to get more viruses like these, which tend to come from animals. And so I, I am uh, optimistic that this is not going to be an ongoing thing, that every five years we'll get a new one. Um, Isidora is asking you a question about uh, your prelude fertility, your fertility clinics that you that you built in the United States and which grew into the largest chain of fertility clinics in the United States um, in a very short time that we are left with. Uh, what was the main reason for you making this successful revolution growing so fast? What was behind the exponential growth of your fertility uh, business? And is your model replicable in a developing relatively poor country like Serbia? Well, Prelude focuses on, on two things, uh, fertility preservation or egg freezing and IVF, uh, in vitro fertilization. And I, and I think that when I started the company, I, uh, well, I have seven children myself, so I'm pretty much into being a dad. And I think being a dad is the best thing in the world. And so is being a mom. Other people may think differently, but I certainly love being a dad. My last three, my youngest three children were born out of this technology. They were born out of IVF and they were also born out of fertility preservation, genetic testing of embryos. I, I, I became a father of my last children who are eight, seven and three out of using this technology. So, ha, so what does this technology allow you to do? Well, it allows you to have children later in life not having them all in your 20s or 30s, but to have them in your 40s and sometimes 50s. Now, the desire to have children later in life, and maybe not your first child, but your last child, is probably something that in people in Serbia and people in any, in many countries want. Uh, I, I don't think women want to marry in a rush because they feel their, their fertility is about to end. I think fertility preservation is a great technology so you can be a master of your own destiny and have more options. And so I think, yes, this, what we do in the States can very well be done in Serbia and in other countries as well. And the last question there is uh, coming from Anna. Uh, give me the reason to be hopeful under these circumstances. Well, I would have to ask Anna how old she is. Um, if Anna is eighty, presumably, presumably, say, presumably she's in the in, in in the university right now. Oh, okay. Well, then you have plenty of reason to be hopeful, concretely about this pandemic because it really doesn't seem to do much to anyone under forty, but also because in the worst moments of fear, uh, it is it is. It is difficult to be hopeful, but 
whenever it rained, it stopped. And it will stop raining this time too. Um, this is not a permanent uh, event of humanity. This is a temporary event. Um, I also think that technology will find a solution, this, this a vaccine or a treatment, and that makes me hopeful. But I must share with Anna that I have a lot of concerns about the short term and the next six months. And I think we can be concerned in the short term, but more hopeful and confident in the long term. Well, thank you very much, Martin, for spending the time with us tonight. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, we gave the title uh, to this talk, uh, Is It Really That Bad? And uh, as I thought, you would have been the brightest interlocutor uh, that we have had. You always looked at the bright side. That's how I remember you since the time when we met. You made certainly me feel much more hopeful than, uh, than until now. I hope uh, Anna is uh, as pleased as I am with, uh, with this, uh, not just the last answer, but the entire conversation. It's been fascinating once again. Thank you, my dear friend, Martin Versowski from, from Madrid, exclusively to the followers of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development. Keep following us in the days and weeks to come. Good night.